back in ancient history, probably, well, it was 1973. I do remember when it was in November. I started talking about amalgam, how the mercury came out of the fillings and created some diseases that we should not be responsible for creating. And uh, what I did was create a lot of animosity with the dental association and still with uh, many dentists. That is calming down. I don't have nearly as much animosity. In fact, I feel exonerated now that the FDA has admitted we should not be placing amalgam in uh, children under seven and in pregnant females. Now, I've always wanted to be treated like a pregnant female. How come they get all this special attention? <clears throat> so now that things are calming down, it's time to stir the water again. Some years ago, I was giving a talk in California, and a guy came up to me and started pulling on my sleeve, and I had finished the talk, and a lot of people had come up to ask questions. And this guy kept, what do you want? And he said, I want your address. I have something very important to send to you. Okay. Well, I gave him a business card. And six months later, I got a box. There was no return address on it. I didn't know where it came from or anything about it. And finally, I found out where it came from. And so I called him and I said, what is this? At that time, I was taking my master's in immunology at University of Colorado and learned a lot of things, like do not quote anything over two years old because it's of no value. And I looked, and here are papers from 1910, 1920, 1930, nothing of any value. And so I asked him about this, and he said, I was a good friend of Weston Price. And Price... <coughs> called me to his deathbed and he said you know my work is too important to die with me my work on root canals see if you can find somebody who can be stimulated to pick up my work and continue it that was in 1947 40 years later that was given to me So as I opened this material, it was like looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the last four or five years, I've done a lot of looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I find that's quite interesting. But this material was interesting. And from that time, which was, I don't know, 1985 probably, until last year, I was never able to add one word to the work of Weston Price. He was that far advanced over where we are today. Now with our work with DNA identification of these microbes, I feel that for the first time I can say something that adds to what Weston Price tried to tell us now, 100 years ago. And what I have found is, yes, the microbes have a certain amount of damage that they do. Heavy metals, not just mercury, but copper and nickel and beryllium, all of these do a certain amount of damage. And we've always looked at them individually, just like, you know, the one bug, one disease, one cure concept that I was taught back in school. You know, there is one bug, um, Staphylococcus pneumonia, which causes pneumonia which is the one disease it causes, pneumonia. There's one cure, penicillin, one on one on one. We don't have that advantage today because the heavy metals get together and form complexes and they work in conjunction with the bacteria who work in families and work outside of their own families. So we get this together and we have an entirely new type of warfare in disease from what we've had before. When working in mercury toxicity, um, people kept asking, how do I know if I'm mercury toxic? How can I tell? What's the test that tells? And I said, there's only one test that really tells 
if you have a mercury problem, and that's cremation. <laughs> that was not popular. <laughs> but my answer in the second sentence was, mercury crosses all barriers. It can create a problem in any cell, any place in the body. So there is no single test to show mercury toxicity, whether you're toxic or not. But over the last year, I have found something that I consider a biomarker, something that I consider letting me know, is the patient toxic, how toxic are they, and how long is it going to take for them to get well? Huh. Pretty good. What it is, is methylmercury on the red blood cell. And there is a fellow, Chris Shade, PhD, who has, well, he did his um, PhD uh, dissertation and investigation on being able to detect mercury at much lower levels, about one to a hundred lower than what we were able to do before. And I started doing these tests. And as usual, I had no idea what I was going to find when I went into them. But going into them, eventually, like the first time we did it on a case, I found something I wish I had known before I treated that fellow. He had come from South Africa. And it cost a lot of money, and as usual, there was a lot of pressure from the family. Um, so they expected a miracle, and a miracle did not happen. At the end of two weeks, we usually see some really nice changes. With him, we saw nothing. At the end of a month, nothing. At the end of two months, nothing. Three months, nothing. Four months, we finally were getting someplace. And in looking at methylmercury on the red blood cell, we found that he had the highest level of methylmercury on the red cell that we had ever seen. And looking over that particular class of people, we saw that here he was up on a curve kind of like this, like an X equals Y square curve. He's up here at six parts per billion. And down here at 0.6, people were beginning to respond at 0 0.5, 0 0.4. Hey, as you go down, they really get well. But you get up here to two, you got some problems. And you get up to six and you've got a lot of problems. We were able to do methylmercury on him from a bazillion miles away. And when he finally got down to two, we began to see some changes. If I had known that to start with, if I had been able to look at his, which I did, but I didn't know what, how to interpret it, if I had seen six parts per billion, I could have said, oh, man, it is going to take months before you're going to see any change. And that would have saved us about 500 emails of, why am I not well yet? Because if you're up there, no, you're not going to be well. And how long is it going to take? It depends on how fast you come down that curve. We had one woman who had not spoken a word in three years. She had, um, what's that called? I keep forgetting. Alzheimer's. Uh, <clears throat> And within two or three days from being, you know, when you get real advanced Alzheimer's, you get this silly grin, and it just stays there. And that's all. They don't say anything. But after about the third day, her daughter was taking her out of the wheelchair, putting her into bed, and she reached up and grabbed hold of her daughter's sweater, which was tied like girls tie, you know, these sweaters things grabbed it and pulled it over her face and sat back and laughed <laughs> the daughter cried for an hour because it was the first sign that somebody was there in three years. That was very fast. Where was she? She was way down here on the curve. So if you're way down here, chances are we're going to see some kind of a response. Well, who's exposed to mercury more than anybody else? Dentista. So the dentist, we found, uh, here's our good area.
down in here, and there aren't. Is that a fountain pen? <laughs> Electronics is not my field. You press on this thing. Okay, here's a good area down here, and where are our dentists? They're up in there. Now, this fellow I was telling about was up here at six. Um, here's where our fast recovery is, and here is our slow recovery. But here are where the patients is. You see, we got a bunch of them down here, and then there are some up here. These are going to be the slow recovery. All right, let's uh, look at the next slide here. And we see dentist versus serious patients. And we find the serious patients, by serious, I am speaking of Lou Gehrig's disease, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, lupus, leukemia, things like that. These are here. Where are the dentists? Very few of them here, but a lot of them up in here. So these are the people who are the accident looking for a place to happen. Um, there was a fellow who went through one of our programs who uh, was asking about what's the age of dentist at death. And I said, well, I don't believe it, but the ADA says 76 point something or another. And he was from Missouri, which I don't consider the basic high stress state. And um, he went through the records of the last 100 dentists to die in the state of Missouri. The average age at death was 52.5. Which reminds me, in the last 25 hours, I have seen 25 people that I have not seen in 25 years. <clears throat> Thank you guys very much for coming. Give yourself a hand. I appreciate that. A hand means, you know, putting the two of them together. You know, I was talking about mercury toxic dentists, and I think that was an example. <laughs> But so many times, and this is in particular true of what we see with the bacteria coming from root canals, the first symptom is a fatal heart attack. So that shows that the people in this group have a little more interest in health than some of our colleagues. So that's why it pleases me to be here, especially knowing we have physicians and dentists both in the audience, because that's the only way that you come out of MS, ALS, and these other incurable diseases. Dentists are great at mechanics, but I'm sorry to say it, but a, a good friend of mine uh, from one of the higher organizations in dentistry called me a few years ago and he says, you know, I think you're right about that mercury. I, I think it's really doing me in. Can you look at my chemistries? And I said, yes, the first thing we need is a CBC. And he said, how do you spell that? <laughs> Dentists have a long ways to go in interpreting chemistry, but the physicians don't. They know what a CBC is. They know a glucose from a cholesterol, from a triglyceride. But working together, we see miracles happen. <clears throat> Well, methylmercury is the thing that we're seeing on the red blood cells. And methylmercury is a good indicator of what's going on because where do the red blood cells go? Everywhere. But the things that are most prominent would be like the placental barrier. That's not a barrier to mercury. And it took a long time to understand what was happening with methylmercury. There was a lot in the literature but it wasn't clearly explained, and until something is simple, I don't really catch on to it. But methylmercury and ionic are pretty simple. Ionic mercury, HG++, is very vicious. It can kill anything that it can reach. But if methylmercury, I mean, if uh, ionic mercury was standing right here, 
it could not do any damage to anybody in this room because it couldn't reach more than just a small diameter. Where methylmercury, I picture this as having a, uh, a long white stretch limousine and it can go everywhere. And it comes along and it sees a phone booth and it jumps out of the car, jumps into the phone booth, peels off and you see its costume. The methylmercury is converted into HG++ and then it kills everything that's around it. Then it jumps back into the limousine and travels off again. And wherever it stops, it kills. So it can switch back and forth. This is why methylmercury is considered the most dangerous form of mercury because it can go anywhere and when it gets there, it can do anything. Crossing the placental barrier, you go back 30 years ago, there were only two things that created birth defects, and that was mercury and um, what was the other one? There was one other thing. Oh, radiation. Radiation and mercury were the only two things that created birth defects. Now I find the main thing I hear about with birth defects is where we have a husband and wife who are both dentists. Husband and wife where they both work in a dental office. So we have done studies on the sperm and there is quite enough mercury in the sperm to create birth defects at the half cell level. That's before conception. What's a primary place in the female body where mercury collects? the uterus. What I cannot explain is how does pregnancy take place. You are throwing seeds into infertile soil and you know maybe we are all some kind of miscreants. Um, if you go back to Adam and Eve, it wouldn't surprise me but what Adam and Eve had one eye in the middle of their forehead and we are all um, some kind of genetic anomaly <laughs> from that time on. <clears throat> I wasn't really taught this in dental school, but my curiosity carries me into other areas. We have noticed, uh, is everybody here familiar with the medical term a D&C? One cleaning. per dusting and cleaning, right. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, this is something that they do to a uterus and um, I have found that we can create a dental DNC if, 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 if. Now I have a long protocol that I recommend and there are people who say, and I'm sure you know these people, you don't have to do all that. All you have to do is yank out amalgam. I found that's not true. Um, but if, 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 if you take the fillings out in the proper sequence, if you use the rubber dam, if you have filtration systems, if you put in a filling that's compatible with the immune system, this is something we developed when I was at the University of Colorado, we found there are a lot of dental materials that challenge the immune system, but what challenges your system is not necessarily what challenges my system. So the blood test determines what it is. And now, so many people say, yeah, I had my fillings removed and had the white fillings put in. Well, the majority of the white fillings contain aluminum. And that aluminum is not stable. The aluminum that is in porcelain crowns is not stable. There are a lot of people who tell you it is. But if you look at the blood chemistry, you'll find out that if it was stable, it would not be changing the blood chemistries. And that's why blood chemistry is my guide, because it is very sensitive to the changes that take place. Okay, we had um, somebody volunteer here the other day where we had a certain amount of methylmercury in the red blood cell. And then if you do the 7, 14, 21 day cycles and follow all of this in your dental revision, either the next month or the month after that you will have, this is for primarily for females, you will have a very heavy period and it may be two or three days longer than usual. 
And so we did blood samples there of the mensis blood, and we found that the, the blood in the menstrual blood, the mercury, was the same as what it was in the, um, <clears throat> in the antecubital blood, the venous blood. But the amount of mercury from the uterine blood was 2,600% higher. This is what makes me wonder how pregnancy occurs. But if you have that much mercury in the uterus, how far is that from the rest of the guts? So any problem that occurs in the, in the visceral area can be from mercury coming out of the lining of the uterus. So now we have some other studies uh, lined up to do before and after dental revision and follow this. But I find that quite interesting. The uterus is the primary collection point for um, <clears throat> mercury in the female and the prostate for the male. Um, But what happens if you've had a hysterectomy? If you have had a hysterectomy, the mercury still goes to that area. But there is no uterus there. Thank you. So where does it go? It jumps into the spinal fluid and goes up and dumps into the brain. So is there a chance that this is related to PMS? If you have a uterus or don't have a uterus, it could still be controlled by the amount of mercury that is contained in the uterus. So when you put a filling in, you have no idea where that mercury is going except that it's going everywhere. I spent four years working in immunology at the University of Colorado and found that this was probably the most important four years of my life because I had eight years of college before that. But I didn't really learn the thinking process until I saw the things, why you do the things in a master's program that you do. Why do you read these things and write them up and why do you have to have the references and why do they have to be in order and why, and why you have to learn weasel words because the one thing you can't really tell is the truth. It might, it is possible, and then if you need money, further investigation is necessary. That means, I got some secrets and I'm not going to tell you unless you give me a stipend for next year. So it's a strange world out there. So I spent a lot of years, a total of 13 years in college, and it hasn't taken. I'm still not an academic. I still like people. I learn from watching what happens with people. And boy did I learn about the immune system and I learned that dentistry controls the immune system. Dentistry controls the endocrine system. Dentistry controls the blood-brain barrier. Dentistry controls the nervous system. There is not a thing that goes on in the human body that is not under the direct control of the dentist. Dentists have a tremendous responsibility and they are not taught. So let's go to the physicians because this is what the Dental Association said. Uh, we developed a test some years ago back in the early 80s on a patch test to see if people were sensitive to mercury and the ADA made me shut that down. They said no. It's okay for dentists to put mercury in, but it's not okay to find out if it's damaging the patient. You have to send them to the physician, to a dermatologist. Dermatologist? So we would check with several members of the medical profession. They say, well, I never had anything on toxicology. I wouldn't know how to test for mercury toxicity. So the ADA got what it wanted. Things were put on hold. And so they were not bothered. There are very few people who know that the ADA is a privately held corporation. It's not a professional organization. 
and there are very few people who know where its money is held and how much money it is worth. It is a very large organization. Just cross it sometime. I'll give you a little hint as to what they can do for you. <clears throat> but dentistry does control all of these things. How does it control the endocrine system? The endocrines, most of them have three or four binding sites. Thyroid has three. Um, estrogen has four. Um, testosterone, all of these things have binding sites which mercury loves to attach to. And when it attaches, it stops the function. It does not go away so that you can do a test for thyroid function. You can do a test for um, estrogen and testosterone. And yes, here it is. You got so many micrograms. But what it doesn't tell you is there's an atom of mercury in here which prevents its activity. So yes, you've got it, but it's not active. So it's, the problem is all in your head. It is, but it's in the lower third of the head, not the upper third of the head. <clears throat> all right, what's our big exposure to inorganic mercury? Uh, some of you have been in my office. This is the this is the famous bubble operatory, which was the only really safe dental environment that was ever built. It's in the shape of a bubble, so there are no corners for things to catch. Uh, there was air filtration. There was um, laminar airflow with positive pressure on the top, filtration up here for air conditioning and heating, suction down in the bottom that pulled the air out and um, piped it out of the building to the guy next door. I didn't like him much. <laughs> and you can see inside here, and this is the thing that uh, cost in the six figures to build. Oh, it's in a Faraday cage too. The whole outside is a Faraday cage so that you take a cell phone in there, it wouldn't work. There's a lot of radiation. There are thousands of different radiant energy patterns that hit us that the mercury toxic patient cannot tolerate. So in this environment, people would walk in, be there two seconds, and say, I haven't felt this good in many, many years. And that was because of the electrical sensitivity. But the Attorney General made me destroy this because it implied that mercury might be hazardous. Well, it is. But in the dental office, I have talked to so many dentists say, I'm mercury free. You're mercury free? There's no mercury in your office? No, not at all. You've never removed an amalgam? No, I take out 10 or 20 every day. Well, I tell you, there is a whole lot more mercury coming out of cutting out an amalgam than there is in placing an amalgam. So there's no such thing as a mercury free environment unless you have something like this, unless you have the big thing that you wear to go 20,000 leagues under the sea you know, with the canisters on it. Yes, for people who are aware of what it's doing to themselves. Yeah, the dentist, the assistants, even though they have the negative ion generators going, still wear protective gear. Because there are a lot of things that happen to dentists that you don't even want to know about. And the ionic is one that does that. Um, sequential removal I discovered back in 1979 and we could see that if you took out the negative current fillings first by measuring the electrical charge given off by the fillings, patients got better. If you took out the positive, the patients got worse. And, no, okay, so we took out the negatives first. And it was 79, 89, 99, it was about uh, more than 20 years after that, that I finally figured out what was going on. I happened to be taking a course at that time on brain metabolism and found out what was going on in the synapse. And the synapse is something else that dentistry controls. You put a atom of mercury in here in the synapse and we don't have those impulses going on anymore. The nerves don't die, but they don't work. Sometimes you call this emotional problems. Sometimes you call it suicidal. 
Anybody want to take a guess on how many people I have seen in the last three years who have what are called floating suicidal thoughts that most of the time they don't tell anybody they've got? A dozen times a day the thoughts come through. They don't do it, but, you know, where are they coming from? Is that you, God? Did I do something bad? You know, where do they come from? But these floating suicidal thoughts are usually gone within two days of initiating treatment, even if they've had them for 20 years. What's the percentage of people? How many people would believe it is over 50%? Anybody believe that? One person. Okay, two. All right. <clears throat> How many people would believe it is over 90% of the people that we have seen? I'll put my hand up. Yes, over 90%. And you have to be, I don't know, the word is sneaky, but you have to be psychologically cautious when presenting this with somebody because, I mean, that's worse than showing your underwear. That's really getting personal. But I will look at the chemistries. And I'll look here. And I'll look over there. I'll say, oh, you know, you have a chemistry pattern that I've seen on a lot of people that have these unidentified floating suicidal thoughts going on. And I do not make eye contact with a patient at this time. I say this is something that's just kind of the natural byproduct of mercury. And you've got the pattern for it. Have you ever? And I look up and they're usually crying because I press the button where nobody has gone before. That yes, if they have amalgam in their mouth, they probably have floating suicidal thoughts that we as dentists have created. To me, that's crossing over the line. But coming back to this, in studying brain metabolism, I found that if you take out the negative current fillings first, you stimulate the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system by shifting the balance at the synapse where it is high in potassium. If you take out the positive current fillings first, this causes a shift so you have a higher sodium level at the synapse. And that creates the fight or flight sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, which stimulates the production of thyroid, testosterone, anterior pituitary, and adrenaline, which leads to a drop in the serum phosphorus and degenerative disease. Whereas if you take out the negative quadrants first, you will have a population higher in potassium and Potassium, what is it? I don't know. Maybe 101% of the people are deficient in an active form of potassium. So this is always a big one, is working with potassium, which stimulates the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, which stimulates the parathyroid as opposed to the thyroid, estrogen for healing as opposed to testosterone, Posterior pituitary, the calming effect, insulin, the calming effect, and healing effect as compared to anterior pituitary and adrenaline. And this is where you see the reversals in multiple sclerosis. And I am real pleased now that with Lou Gehrig's disease, we are now up to about 30% reversal. Where with Lou Gehrig's, if they tell you that, they give you the mortician's card at the same time. And they usually tell you how many days, weeks, or months you have to live. And the physicians are so rude when they diagnose somebody <clears throat> with ALS, I can hardly believe that they're supposed to be doctors. But they're embarrassed because there is no treatment. There's no pill. There's no injection. It's just, well, you better get your affairs in order because you got ALS and it's terminal. So what's ALS? Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Oh, so what's that? Well, it's a terminal disease and I've got another patient I have to see and they walk out and leave them nailed to the wall. I have seen this in everyone. We have seen over 400 people with ALS created by dentistry. And they were all treated by their physician the same way with rudeness. 
But there are some people with ALS who want to live. There are people with MS who want to recover. And we have found the psychological aspects of those diseases that if they are not addressed and corrected, the patient doesn't make it. So here's where we have to go back to the physician or the psychologist, not a psychiatrist, but a psychologist. These diseases can be turned around, but more importantly, they don't have to happen because the origins are pretty clear. But we do have to get into regeneration. We have to be aware of uh, endocrinology. We have to be aware of brain metabolism. We have to be aware of the chemistries. Uh, chlorine is not in here, but it is a very important one. But we did a study in our office in which we had people, <clears throat> had one of our gals call. We got a lot of telephone calls, and we have a system called the Alliance. These are dentists and a few physicians who have been taught the mechanics of what it takes to turn around these incurable diseases. And, you know, sometimes people call and say, well, is there a dentist across the street or within uh, walking distance of my home that does everything that Huggins does? And he does it for free. Um, Sometimes the nearest dentist is 800 to 1,000 miles away. Well, I'm not going to go that far. I'll just go to the guy across the street and have him put in some of them white fillings. Okay. Six months later, we call back, find out if they went to an alliance dentist we referred them to, or if they went to the guy across the, tea, the street to get them yanked out. And of those people who went across the street and just had them yanked out, 63% of those people now have a disease they did not have, an autoimmune disease they did not have before having their fillings removed. Why? Because accidentally some of the positives were taken out first. We stimulated the degeneration cycle and we had aluminum containing composites. We have nickel based crowns put in. Oh, and let's throw in a few implants and some other things we'll be talking about today. Of course, everybody needs a root canal now. Um, you put all these things in and people end up with diseases they did not have of dental origin. <clears throat> One other thing, now, I don't know, Weston Price came out of that box. He was about this big and he'd sit on my left shoulder and he would point out to me in his books what I should be reading. And when he'd shake his head, I'd skip it and go on to something else. Kind of a st strange relationship. But this is what I went through in order to learn what the direction of continuing Weston Price's work was. Um, and Pat Conley, I had known for 30 years at that time, and Price kept talking about calcium, but he would talk about it, and then he'd talk about another portion, and then he'd mention it. There's a connection here someplace, and I was missing that connection, so I got the idea. You must have written a fourth book. So I call Pat Conley. I said, how come you didn't have give me the fourth book? You know he only wrote three. No, he wrote a fourth one. Where is it? And so I got where I was calling, oh, well, every couple of months just to devil her because she got all upset when I call her. Maybe because I called her Patrick. <laughs> <clears throat> but then I found some things in the Dead Sea Scrolls of Price that led me into some other areas and Pat called. And she, I had gone through this huge two-car garage that was probably 15 feet high on the inside, full of papers. If any of you have seen my office, my personal office at home, it was a lot worse than that, if imaginable. But I mean, uh, there's one corner over there. I didn't even go to that corner because it was absolutely piled to the ceiling. But they started going through that to see what was in it, and they found a safe. The safe had not been opened since 1926. 
And in that safe, they found what I had been predicting, the manuscript to Price's fourth, fourth book on calcium metabolism. I have read that four times. I still don't understand it. But I understand parts of it, enough to work with calcium metabolism. The calcium in the ionic form, which is not what you have in coral calcium, dolomite, bone meal, oyster shell, the electrons have been gone for a million years or more there, except oyster shell. But the ionic calcium carries electrons to the mitochondria, and we have lots of mitochondria in every cell. Some just 400, some 3,000. But the mitochondria produces ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is our primary energy source. And it takes an active form of calcium to carry two electrons specifically into the mitochondria. And that's what makes the system operate. But when it has delivered its electrons, that becomes non-biological calcium. It's a contaminant. It gets into areas of enzyme systems where it can't do anything. So you might as well not have that enzyme system. You either have to get rid of that calcium, which you do with an active form of magnesium, or you can regenerate it. Vitamin C will regenerate it. Vitamin C is like St. Nicholas. Where calcium gives its electrons only to the mitochondria, magnesium gives them here, zinc gives it there. Vitamin C has a whole bag full of electrons and it gives it to everybody. Hey, Santa Claus is just throwing out little bits of candy electrons to anybody who's standing near. So vitamin C also has two electrons, but it gives it to anybody. And it can give it to calcium to recharge it. Vitamin E, if it's not overdosed, and when you get vitamin E in the serum above 5.3 milligrams per cent, you're overdosed in vitamin E, and that will cause what's called a blebbing of the red blood cells, so you can count the red blood cell, but it cannot carry oxygen anymore. So here's part of chronic fatigue. Regeneration by ultraviolet light, you go buy some glasses. I say, how much are the glasses? Well, it's a hundred dollars. If you don't flinch, they say for the frames. <laughs> say, well, how much are the lenses? Well, those are fifty dollars. If they don't flinch, you say each. <laughs> okay, so you get up here to three, four hundred dollars for a pair of glasses. Oh, by the way, you don't want to be exposed to that terrible ultraviolet light. So we put a, a UV coating on that for $20 per lens. Glass, as in spectacles today, does not allow UV to go through. We have studied this. We have measured the amount that went through with glasses of 80 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, and today there is no UV coming through. Why? Because the UV energizes, activates our whole endocrine system. So if you wear glasses, you can't get any of that. You have to get it directly from the sun now. And a little secret. I will tell... Hmm? Vitamin, D. vitamin D? No, ultraviolet light. Vitamin D helps. But it's like landing a 747. How many wheels do you want on the runway if you're in the plane? Do you want just vitamin D on the runway? Or do you want all the wheels? And this is the secret of what I found, is there is no magic bullet. It takes everything. Uh, where was I? Is anybody listening? Contact lens. Contact lens. Contact lenses depends on whether they are plastic or uh, glass. The glass ones do not let it come through. The others do. But with ALS, how come we're getting improvements in something where nobody can get to first base 
because of ultraviolet light. After you get the causative factors out, which are the dental causative factors, if you don't get exposed to 30 minutes of ultraviolet light directly from the sun every day or from a lamp that gives off a black light, that gives off, you're going to die. And I'm very direct with these people. I talk to them about life and death. And they come in and say, okay, what's your death sentence? How many, uh, how many months did they give you? And they relax because I'm not going to come in and say, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. No, it's not going to be okay. You got a terminal disease and you got a chance to turn it around. If, 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 if. Now, do you want to know the ifs? And how hard do you want to work to live? What would your life be like if you were to be alive five years from now? What would you be doing if you didn't have this disease? Get into their soul and find out if it wants to stay on this planet. And if it does, you will get UV exposure every cotton picking day. Because not only does it give you the ionic form of calcium, which is the primary thing that is needed for healing of any part of the body, because ATP is pretty important. But yes, we have to keep the whole body functional. And if it's, you know, Minnesota, you don't have too many days, you can go out and sunbathe. Okay, get a black light, set it up, strip down to your skivvies, expose yourself to the light. <laughs> fifteen minutes that way, fifteen minutes this way, you'll make it if you do everything else too. But UV is something that you cannot leave out. So UV is something, where did I learn about that? Western Price. I could probably talk for another two hours on it. <laughs> but as you know, there's a lot of different vitamin C out there. But actually about any vitamin C is going to be giving you electrons. It's the delivery system. But I'm sorry, but I'm not going to take the time to go into that. And then there's something that all of us remember. We really don't have to spend much time on this because I'm sure everybody has studied and has total recall of Krebs cycle. Anybody here who has not studied Krebs cycle? What planet are you from? <laughs> Okay, Krebs cycle goes around and around and around. What is it, a million times a minute or something of that nature? Yep, down here comes porphyrins. Okay, so what's a porphyrin? A porphyrin is a molecule that has eight carboxies on it. And if you're going to study this with something like high pressure liquid chromatography, which I used to have two systems of that because we did it on all of our patients. If you're looking at porphyrins in the urine, you'll get a, if you have just the eight carboxies, you'll have a level of eight, and it'll show up over here as a total. Because generally you have eight, seven, sixes, five, fours. Um, there's a pre coper porphyrin that we were never able to find, but it's supposed to be related to mercury. And then there is a three and a two. And the two shows up from people who have cavitations. And you clean out the cavitations and it doesn't show anymore. So here's another biomarker. Uh, there are a whole lot of ways to clean out cavitations without cutting a hole and going in and cleaning it out. Do they work? Show me the porphyrins. Show me the twos and I'll tell you whether it worked or not. But then there is a three carboxy that does not show up in human beings. But we have found it in dentists. <laughs> Now, there are three enzymes that come in here and cleave off these carboxyls, C double O H, if you don't remember what a carboxyl is. And these enzymes cleave them off. Now, if you cleave off another one, you get down to the seven carboxy, which looks like this. Cleave off the next one, you come down to uh, <clears throat> six. But as we get the last cleavage done, we end up with a molecule called heme which is one of the more important molecules in the body. 
And heme can be converted into hemoglobin, or it can be converted into ATP. Heme plus iron plus globin gives you hemoglobin. And you have something on the order of 400 hemoglobin molecules in each red blood cell. Now, heme can take the other path and go through the cytochrome oxidase series, popping out ATPs, carbon dioxide, and water. And this is the water that you see in urine. You don't take a drink of water and it comes out as, uh, uh, as urine, but it comes as a result of the breakdown of heme through the cytochrome oxidase series. Okay, so what can cleave these things off. Mercury, nickel, which is found in chrome crowns. And boy, is that part vicious. We had this program last month of the 40 most significant chemistries I've seen in the last 40 years. <clears throat> and there is a physician from Texas, a female persuasion, who specializes in uh, urinary tract infections on children. When I was a kid, nobody had urinary tract infections. What are we talking about? Now that's her specialty. And what is present 100% of the time in these kids who have all kinds of problems down there? Chrome crowns. Give all the drugs in the world, they still have problems. Take the chrome crowns out, and they don't have problems anymore. Uh, Dr. Medina, if any of you have a chance to listen to her, with <laughs> you. <clears throat> wear your bulletproof vest. <laughs> there are all kinds of things bouncing off the wall when she talks. And she does not like the way... She wrote to her dentist and said, you know, by putting these chrome crowns in, you're destroying these children. So the dental association came back and said, you're practicing dentistry without a license. We're going to sue you. She's a friend of Blanche Gruby's, and I think there's a... <laughs> There's a genetic similarity in here. Don't cross either one of them. So the Dental Association says, you fill out this 20 pages of stuff telling you where you had your dental education and all this. She went in and she said, it's my responsibility to maintain the health of these children. And it's my responsibility to let the world know that you are guilty of malpractice by putting these chrome crowns in children. And I've got all the proof I need, which she is currently writing articles showing that. And she's rather bombastic when she's in a friendly group. She'll let you know how she feels about it. But the nickel in braces does the same thing. The nickel in crowns. According to the laboratories, 85% of the crowns a dentist order are made out of nickel, unless maybe they come from China, then it's got a lot of lead in it. Uh, root canal toxins, cavitation toxins, yeah, <laughs> they come in and cleave those things off, and where do they go? Into the urine. And when you find them in the urine, you find the eights, the sevens, the six, the fives, the fours, and the total. There is a whole lot of fuss. The 4-carboxy, this is due to mercury. If you have the 5, this is probably due to methyl mercury. And if you carry dentistry... And then you start looking, and this causes the 8s, this causes the 4s, lead causes the 6s, g t g t this is considered a biomarker. I do not consider it a biomarker at all. I consider this a biomarker, the total amount. I don't care whether it comes from cavitations or root canals or nickel or mercury. You don't need any of those things as contaminants to your immune system, to your endocrine system, to your quality of life. What you need is zero over here. Well, can zero happen? Uh, this is the second lowest. We just recently found one at two, but this was for many years the lowest I ever found at 12 micrograms, and it was just the fours, which gave us a total of the same thing, 12 in the total. So this is a kid, 21 years old, who had never had any fillings, never had braces, never had anything dental-wise done in his mouth. 
Let's contrast this with this person who has multiple sclerosis. Uh, did she have 12, oh, 12? Well, turn the 12 around, uh, 2, 1, 2,100. She had amalgams, crowns, and cavitations. But she had 8s and 7s and 6s and 5s and 4s. I don't really care where they came from. This is the thing that bothers me because this is your energy literally going down the toilet. This is what's in the urine. Now, within 10 days, we went from 2,100 to 200. Is that a statistically significant drop? I don't really care for statistics because statistics is worried about what's more, this or this, and is there a statistical significance? What I'm worried about is this versus that. You don't need statistics to understand that 2100 is more than 200 of something very valuable here that's going out in the urine. Is it a miracle? We here, I mean, I have treated over a thousand MS patients and many of them will say, oh, it's a miracle. Look, I've gotten out of the wheelchair and walked. Is it a miracle just because all of this energy is now being utilized for ATP and hemoglobin? No, that is not a miracle. That's a matter of ridding the body of toxicity. And you rid the body of toxicity, yes, you can get up and walk. There is no miracle in my book to that at all. <clears throat> now, does this always happen? Oops. Here is the average increase in porphyrins, 37. The red is the increase. Oh, wait a minute. I thought we were getting rid of dental materials so that we could see this sort of thing, where our starting average is 140. Six days later, we're down to 104, an average decrease of 36 in less than a week. From here, clear down to here, here, down to here. Yeah, this is what we want to see. But it doesn't always happen. Why? Because we were not careful for our patient. If you do not use the rubber dam, if you do not have negative ion generators, if you do not have high suction, if you don't keep a lot of water on that filling while you're cutting it out, if you clean a cavitation or take out a root canal without intravenous vitamin C, you are pushing some of the world's most horrible toxins into the bloodstream and you are cleaving off the carboxyls and giving you elevated porphyrin levels. So porphyrins will tell you how well are you treating your patient? Well. But I, I, I send the patient for IV vitamin C the next day. Okay, you're at Macy's, you're going across the street to Bloomingdale's. It's raining, you got an umbrella. Do you run across the street to Bloomingdale's and then put the umbrella up? When do you need the umbrella? You need it when you're being precipitated on. And your patients are being precipitated on in a major way when you're taking out a root canal, when you put that cold steel to the tooth, that first, you've got the toxins and you've got the bacteria going into the bloodstream. That's the time they need to be protected. Now, I'm telling you in a perfect world, I mean, in the places that I work, we do work in as close to a perfect world as we can, but not everybody can do that. So is it better to do it before or after? Well, probably before. But you're still going to get an increase in porphyrins. But if you have a physician dentist team working together, you won't have that happen if you know where the patient needs to be protected. Now, what happens to red blood cells when things are done properly? You know, there is a male range and a female range. One of the things we're presenting through the Toxic Element of Research Foundation about red blood cells is that there is no difference between males and females. 
Now there is still room for discussion there. But as far as red cells are concerned, you know, there's the male range and there's the female range because the females do this funny thing every month that males don't, therefore it's abnormal and they can't recover from it. Oh, yes, they can. Because in the absence of dental toxins taken out properly and protecting the patient, the high levels of the male come down, the low levels of the female come up, they come together and come to a point which I call the stability point. The stability point for red blood cells is five, five million. These are a little high, there are reasons for that. These are a little low, there are reasons for that. When you have done everything to the best of your ability and the patient has done things to the best of their ability, 5.0 million is what's going to occur, male or female. There is no difference in red cells in male and female. Now we get into the interesting part here where we get some, um, some new observations that have come up just in the last few months. Here's the periodontal ligament. All right. Do I need to tell you in advance that I'm up to step on somebody's toes? There's a fair amount of people here who have never heard me before, so you may not know that. I'll let you in on another secret. It's a rumor. It's rumored that I'm opinionated. <laughs> and I'm opinionated because in our files now, we have over 200,000 data points of information. I had 12 patients when I went to the ADA about amalgam. We don't have 12 patients now. We have well over 3,000 and we have 200,000 data points behind what I'm saying. Now that I'm starting to talk about root canals, there is some substantial information behind this, including spinal taps, blood chemistries, porphyrins, DNA assays. I'm not going to spend the next 35 years of my life working on root canals like I have working on amalgam. I made a big mistake there. I'm not making that mistake again. But I am going to step on the toes of several people perhaps half the group here. I don't know whether I should apologize for that or not, because what I'm telling you is what we found and what we can substantiate and what we have to do. Hey, I'm talking about root canals. I doubt if there are very many people in this room who have done as many root canals as I have. So I'm not coming from an aspect of being perfect. I mean, when I stand before St. Peter, he's going to say, you placed amalgam for 11 years, and I'm going to say, I took them out for 11 years too. Yeah. <laughs> and he's going to say, look how many root canals you did. And I don't have a defense, except through people like you, who will not place the root canals because of the mistakes that I have made. Okay, here's a little story. A dentist comes in, one of my primary suits is sarcasm. I have a hard time getting away from sarcasm when I get into this. Because a dentist comes in and he sterilizes the tooth. What's he doing? He's sterilizing a column of air in the middle of the tooth. Well, Weston Price proved this years ago where he sterilized 1,000 teeth with stuff that we would ne never dare put into a human being because it's just too toxic, it's too strong. And 48 hours later, 990 of those that were sterile to start with by cultures, 990 out of 1,000 in 48 hours were contaminated except those that he autoclaved. So if you can get your patients to agree. <laughs> but we have a periodontal ligament. And this is the secret of where everything happens. 
Uh, if we look at root canals, okay, we're good. yeah, we kind of got a curve here. Uh, that could create a problem. I have an x-ray. I had an x-ray. I don't know what's happened to it. It's the funniest thing I have ever seen in my life. You know, some people who are not particularly educated are very smart. This kid grew up, he's about five, six years younger than I. We grew up in the same neighborhood. And the way he talked, you just weren't sure how many brain cells were firing. But he worked for a bottling plant that had all this stuff where they're making 7-Up and Coca-Cola and so on. Everything falls apart. The machine stops. You got 500 moving parts in here. What's wrong? He says, you just show me what it's supposed to do at the end, and I'll see if I can't figure out why it doesn't get there. And it would take him 10, 15 minutes to find out where the problem was and to fix it. Well, he was in my office one time, and I'm trying to identify what Price had talked about. It was finding 75 auxiliary canals in a central incisor. I thought there was one canal. But there's 75 auxiliaries in there. So I'm trying to prove this. And so I'm doing all kinds of things and taking the x-rays. And he said, what are you doing here, Doc? I said, well, there are a whole lot of different pathways in these teeth, the little canals. And, and I'm trying to, to find out how Price found out there were 75 of them. He says, you got any of that mercury lying around? I said, no. He said, why don't you get yourself some of that and just pour a little mercury in there and then take an x-ray picture of it. <laughs> oh, okay. C-plus student, but an IQ, functional IQ of 200. So I got some mercury, and I put it in there, and I poured it in there, and I put that in the centrifuge, and pshoom! Ooh, I had to get a new centrifuge. So we packed wax around the end of it, and then with the centrifuge, I got it up to about 5 RPM like this with my finger, which was quite adequate to force mercury down into the canals. And just by happenstance, <laughs> it is central. And the mercury goes down, gets 8 millimeters from the apex, turns around and goes up and then turns around and comes out the side of the tooth. Now you show me an endodontist who can fill that canal. <laughs> I wanted that as the front cover of a book on root canals should I, well I guess I've written one, I'll write another one though. You can't turn corners like that. But mercury put in with a very slow centrifuge will go down in there and show you where these canals are. Now Price also showed, I'm oh, sorry, showed that the laws of physics apply to dentistry. Now there may be a half a dozen people here old enough to work with bread dough. Anybody ever mash down bread? One person. I'm going to have to go into a different business or something. You mash down bread dough and you let go of it, and what happens? It comes back. You take gutta percha and you smash it down in here, and what happens? It springs back. It shrinks. You lose 36% of the volume around here by the cooling, by the compression. You're not sealing it. There is no adherence between gutta percha and dentin. So there will be a space. But we got 75 accessory canals. And when these canals come out, you have a bacterial infection. You have necrotic tissue. Can you get in there with calcium hydroxide and remove all this and sterilize it and sterilize this? No. It cannot be done. <clears throat> But there are bacteria that occur in here, in the dentin tubules. 
It's been a long trip, but it's, it's interesting when you finally get close to the end of it. I guess that's the end of it, that's the apex. But in those Denton tubules, you've got an incubator. And you start growing some anaerobic bacteria in there. And these anaerobes either come out on the outside and get into the periodontal ligament, or you can see most of your shrinkage of your gutta percha is in here, so you've got a nice haven and you get a big abscess down here, and you know what that stimulates? There's certain bacteria that lay down calcium. And they lay down calcium around this. They lay down calcium around the tooth. It's called condensing osteitis. And it makes the root canal tooth look very healthy on an x-ray, and you can't even see the infection down here because you have this layer of calcium going around which looks like good solid bone in through there. So, okay, we take out root canal teeth and cut it off about here and then I've got a rock crusher that I crush this stuff up in and we use DNA to determine the, um, the exact identification of the bacteria that are in there. And we find a certain number of bacteria here. But then, over a period of a year, I found that if we take the tooth out, I mean, you have to take out the periodontal ligament or it's not going to heal. Because healing in here is done by the monocyte. The monocyte's converted into the osteoblast, which is converted to the osteocyte. And as long as you've got a periodontal ligament, that's not going to happen. Um, let's see. See what have I got here? Um, <clears throat> I get these strange ideas. I thought, why don't we take blood from out here? Because the company that does our assays will not study blood because blood is sterile. Okay, so we go in here. And I say we, you know, I'm standing there watching. I haven't picked up a drill in 25 years. Um, so we take the tooth out, and we look at the number of bacteria here. Then we go back, and we take out the periodontal ligament. We get some good blood flow. So we're not looking at the blood that was here t five minutes ago. We're looking at the blood that was out here in the bone someplace. And it comes leaking in here. And we take a sample of that, put it in a little tube, and then... I remember when I was taking my master's, uh, I used to do a lot of work at the university um, at 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night because I was still in practice at that time and this is the time I had to work. Well, the professor liked to come in and work at night too. And he came over one time and he had a, a purple top tube used to collect the CBC and he says, what do you think this is? I said, well, at a guess, I would say it looks like a sample of um, blood in an EDTA tube. And he says, yep. And he takes this little eyedropper and goes, boom, 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 and it turns clear. Well, what'd you do? He said, well, I'm doing flow cytometry on this. I want to know what's going on inside the red blood cell. So I put in this magic potion, and it destroys the membranes. Oh, well, that's real interesting. So I go back to doing my viability studies and didn't think about it from 1985 to 95 to 2005 to 2008. I better find out what that stuff was. So I found out what it is, and I put it into my red blood cell sample, and destroy the membranes and put it into the little sample cuvettes and you can't tell it's blood anymore. And we find a tremendous increase in the number of bacteria and the concentration. Because what's happened here is that we have our incubator and you go down the dentin tubules, you go down the dentin tubules into the ligament and in the periodontal ligament, which is protected from white blood cells and antibiotics, but you have all the nutrient coming in. I mean, you have standing rib roast. 
you have a buffet there that is wonderful. And so these bacteria come in and they eat, and boy, can they reproduce. They can reproduce in 20 minutes. And so we get the bacteria that where I'm doing my little sample in here, the sample may be way below detection level because there aren't very many of them, but then they get out in the periodontal ligament with all this food, and they start growing and multiplying and multiplying, and now we can see bacteria that we could not see in the crushed sample, where I thought I was finding everything. I was finding a very small percentage of what was going on. But if I take the blood from out here in the bone beside it, then we have the bacteria that have been well nourished that grow to voluminous amounts so that every time the patient bites down, squirt, those toxins are going into the lymphatic drainage system, going into the whole body. Well, maybe not the whole body. It has four places it prefers to go. The brain, the heart, the liver, and the kidney. Take your choice. This is what you're doing when you take out a tooth that is dead, dying, or root canal. This is what happens when you clean out a cavitation. So my recommendation is you get the IV vitamin C going, and after a break I'll show you why. Detoxification is delicate. It's like landing a 747. You come in to JFK and you touch down going 2,000 miles an hour, you're going to have problems. If you come in and you're going 100 miles an hour when you touch the runway, you got a whole different kind of problem. So detoxification is delicate. Most of what I see is over-detoxification. Too fast, too strong, too destructive in too many tissues. But I will show you a case in which we were wrong by not doing it enough. So where is that delicate point? Only by following blood chemistry will you know where that point is. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>